Good evening. I am Andrew Smith, Food Studies Department at the New School. The New School is absolutely delighted to host another Times Talks with the New York Times. This is our 41st collaborative program with Times Talks. Our collaborations, <laughs> our collaborations with Times Talk reflect the New School's dedication to addressing cultural, social, and environmental issues. In food studies, we are committed to developing students who will have an impact on the world and will help solve the most pressing issues of our time, such as tonight's focus on food waste. The new school has responded to issues related to food waste by reducing its own waste, co-hosting Zero Waste Food Conference with the Institute of Culinary Education, incorporating food waste into academic courses, and now joining with Times Talks to host this program with two wonderful panelists, one wonderful moderator, and one fantastic film, Wasted, the Story of Food Waste. Please welcome Michelle Gray, Director of Programming at Times Talks. Good evening, everyone. I'm Michelle Gray, the Director of Programming for the New York Times live conversation and performance series, Times Talks, which pairs New York Times journalists with the brightest and boldest creative minds from the fields of film, theater, music, art, fashion, literature, and food. I'm delighted to welcome you to tonight's guest, oh, sorry, to tonight's event with award-winning author, TV host, producer, and former chef, Anthony Bourdain, and James Beard winning chef and co-founder of Mission Chinese, Danny Bowen, as they discuss one of the most pressing issues of our time, global food waste. Wasted, the story of food waste, is a feature-length documentary that will change how people buy, cook, and eat food. Every year, 1.3 billion tons of food is thrown out. That's $218 billion worth of food produced for human consumption that never gets eaten. With one third of the world's food being thrown away even before it reaches a plate, it's time to shed new light on what is food and what is garbage. Moderating the conversation tonight is our very own Kim Severson, a Southern-based correspondent for The Times who covers the nation's food culture. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to Kim Severson, Danny Bowen, and Anthony Bourdain. Wow. Very popular, I see. I feel and you so are far too, away. Anthony, like but Danny, congratulations. So there you Man. go. Hi and welcome. Um, I'm very, I know there's a lot of places you could be spending tonight, and we're really glad you're spending it with us um, to talk about waste, wasted, not being wasted, but food waste. Um, <laughs> And these gentlemen are fresh from their premiere at the, at the, from the red carpet at the Tribeca Film Festival where the movie premiered tonight. So thank you for coming here instead of staying there and doing whatever people who make movies do, which I imagine is very glamorous, but I wouldn't know. Anyway, um, let's, so the movie is wasted and uh, we're going to show just one little taste of it. We have another clip later we'll show you, but let's just get, just so you can get a feel for it. Roll the clip, Jack. I don't even know who Jack is. That his is, name? No. Lobster. We used to feed it to prisoners. Toothfish got renamed Chilean sea bass, even though it's not even a sea bass. And that uni you're paying through the nose for at the sushi bar, they used to call it whore's eggs. As chefs and as cooks, we see how the same thing that everybody told us was shit last year and wouldn't pay for it, would turn their nose up, suddenly, you know, every man bun neck beard in the world is paying, you know, $29.95 for tuna. Remember one tuna, you, you, you bring bluefish into the dock and the cat food buyers were there. People who cook food and spend time with food, they know what the good stuff is. Those dumbasses out in the dining room may not know, but we know, we know, we always knew. Nice. Jeez. So, and when he talked about the dumbasses out in the dining room, he did not mean anybody in this room. So don't no. worry. I'm just glad I don't have a top knot or a neck beard. Right. What is with the neck beard? But anyway, we'll get into that later. <laughs> We're going to ask, uh, talk about food waste for a while. We're going to leave a lot of time for questions. Um, so please don't be shy. And um, we have mics. So later in the um, program, we're going to be taking 
um, a lot of your questions, you'll have a chance to talk to them. But neither one of you all seem like advocate kind of guys to me. You're not Tom Colicchio. You don't have a food policy action council behind you. I would imagine that being an advocate is the last thing that you would probably think you were going to do. So uh, this is true. why did you choose this as your topic? Um, I, I have indeed assiduously avoided being an advocate or uh, an activist for any particular cause. I, I like to be a free agent. Uh, I believe more than anything else in the power of doubt. Uh, I, I loathe in principle the idea of adhering to any orthodoxy or strict belief system because my travels have shown me as I move from place to place that what I thought yesterday is in fact completely wrong again and again. Almost everywhere I go, I am the stupidest person in the room. I'm the least qualified person to really tell you who's in charge, what's really going on, uh, whatever I might have thought of, 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 of their belief system, their religion, uh, their dietary ways, their cultural practices, those things change over time. So I was really reluctant to attach myself to anything like this. But the, the issue of food waste is something that is beaten into every cook who came up in the old school or maybe even the new school. You know, the minute you enter the kitchen, it is a, it is a economic or financial imperative, particularly in the old school French system, um, waste nothing, use everything. And I know that both of us uh, came up in a system where you were punished and humiliated if you wasted or mistreated or disrespected valuable or potentially valuable ingredients. Do you remember in a kitchen, that? I mean, every, you... every ingredient is not worth the cost that you paid for it, it's the three times that you charge for it. So that extra scrap of potato, that fish head, uh, that's money. So that was deep in my cell tissue. Um, so that resonated with me. And then of course my travels around the world I see a lot of people who struggle to live every day, who cook with nothing, who proudly offer me what little they have, and more often than not, it's incredibly delicious, and they've done so much. And of course, as an old school French cook, I understand that, that these ingredients, you know, that the history of gastronomy as we know and love it is transformation, taking what little you have, however tough, however bony, and turning it into something that's flavorful and delicious that people who love you can serve with pride. And so that's really what kind of got me on board this project. Well, Danny, what about you? Are you, you've not, you're not a, you know, you're not joining the James Beard boot camp for legislative advocacy. Not yet. Which actually exists, yeah. by the way. Is that? Not yet. Right. Yeah, it's a thing, it's a thing. The James Beard Foundation is doing, you know, they're training chefs to go and, and lobby legislators and Congress people. Wow. Um, yeah, so... Would I have to change my hair color if that happened? I don't... No, don't change a thing, baby. No, it's so good. Thank you. Well, I think the main reason I got involved is because I, I was asked to be a part of the project and I didn't know anything about food waste. You know, like, like and to echo what you said, like, it was drilled into me to not waste anything, but the statistics were staggering. And I, I as a chef, you know, you're always trying to, like, learn about what you don't know about. And, you, and as a chef, you kind of always you have to break this habit of kind of acting like you know about everything about everything, you know, because you're the boss and people are like, you know everything, right? And I didn't. I didn't know anything about food waste. I didn't know the, the numbers and the, the billions of pounds of food that are wasted globally and then millions. Oh. Yeah, I mean, like, it's like, like just in the U.S. So, you know, I just came into it from a, a very open, um, almost like naive perspective. I wanted to just learn. So that's, that's why I did and, and you didn't come up in the kind of um, uh, traditional European kitchen training that, that Tony did. I did, did. actually. I've had, the, my, I mean, I've had a fair share of like pans thrown at me and chefs that acted very irresponsibly. But um, that was just really, last week, right? Yeah, so, I mean, yeah. Uh, but it, it really shaped, you know, how I approach mm -hmm. uh, my restaurants and my staff. So, yeah, but I did. It's, but I, and I think that there's like some value added to like, you know, that kind of being very militant about something and like, you know, one of my first jobs actually, I, I keep telling this, you've heard this story like five times today probably, Anthony, because we've been talking about this, but. They're I, pretending like this yeah. is the first so time that you guys first have been ever, together today. My first cooking yeah. job ever, there was this guy, Jesse, and he, he made me tie a, um, a plastic trash bag around my waist, and, and, and I was like prepping 
food. And he was like, you're going to today save all of your scraps in this bag, and I'm going to come check. And you know, as the day got, went on, it just got heavier and heavier, because I didn't know what it was. It was like new in the kitchen. you know. And, um, and it was really eye-opening. That was my first entry into like, working in a kitchen, basically, like, um, was this guy like, being like Yeah, every chef at my culinary school, uh, the first thing they do when they come to your station is to check the garbage. What are you throwing out? How efficiently are you handling my food? Right. That's what it was all about. My was. food. My food cost. Right. Uh, what, are you, what are you throwing out? Because right. the right. food cost is huge, so cost obviously drives it in the kitchen. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, you there's all, a moral imperative. Right. Well, you, you know. You've broadened this out a little bit. and we'll, I, well, for, Let me just ask you one quick question about advocacy here, because I know we have, in this age of everything seems very politicized, uh, chefs increasingly, you'll see, I mean, uh, you could argue what Jose Andres is doing in Puerto Rico is a bit political in a way. Um, you know, Tom Colicchio goes and, you know, lobbies Congress. Um, and there's a lot of pushback uh, on the social media, like stay in your lane, just cook me food, shut the hell up, I don't want to hear what Fuck who cares. That. Fuck that. There's okay. nothing. Look, right. is there anything on this planet more political than food? No. No, there is not. Who, who eats? Who doesn't eat? Who is cooking? Who's eating? Who, uh, why, why, why are yeah. we eating the things we eat? What, what got us to this point that we are eating a lot of pickles or dried and preserved food? What does this tell us about you know, uh, our, ourselves? Who is, who is picking, who is, who is picking the, 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 the produce? Who's cutting the meat? Who's shipping the meat? Who's putting it in boxes? There's nothing more political than that. And so every time I hear that online, and I hear it a lot, mm -hmm. you, know, you, know, uh, you know, stick with food, man. Right. <laughs> Stop talking about politics. Right. Well, oh. But it's also a lot on a chef. To, like, not only do you then have to run your restaurant or cook your food or do what you do with food, now you have to go out and be political about it, too. That seems like a... For a lot of chefs who feel pressure to, to be more involved, I, but it's... I, it's I don't feel much. any... I don't, I don't Well, you don't like, that. come on, you're like a star, you like hang around, you travel. But I, but, but I also, ha I had the privilege of working for like old school French, it's like, look, this is what we do, but that's what we do, yeah. you know? Yeah. Uh, what, what do I you don't do? know. I mean, it's interesting, because as a cook, you're uh, taught to keep your head down and just say yes to everything. Bluefin Here. tuna, can I get that at your restaurant? Mm. I don't have it. I can get it for you if you want. <laughs> I don't have it there. Yeah. Um, no, I don't have it there. You know, uh, foie but you, so you make political choices in what you buy to serve. And yeah, we're responsible about it. You know, we have to think about that. You have to think about everything. But I think it comes from a personal perspective. And you know, if we want to serve something that we feel strongly about, we will. But obviously, there's kickback. You know, it's just you just use your common sense and what you feel um, makes sense to you. And to me, it doesn't make sense to have bluefin tuna. Right. The restaurant, but why not? It's just not like a, the most sustainable thing to have. You know, I mean, there's so many other good fish. I'd rather serve a sardine or like an anchovy and get someone excited about that. To me, there's something very easy about things like bluefin tuna. And I mean, oh, I love yeah. my fair share of troubles and everything else, but it's just not challenging. And a chef, it's it, no one wants to phone it in. You know, like you were talking about, like filet mignon. It's like phone in. You know, it's like it, it's so much easier. It's so much more engaging to challenge yourself. I, I, I think it's sort of an important point. I mean, chefs make these value decisions, these karmic decisions all the time. Every chef picks up the phone, orders pork, understanding that somewhere a pig dies. You know, it's like, you know, you're Michael Corleone. You know, you, you don't have to kill the pig yourself, but you, you, you look pig. over at Rocco yeah. and you go, and somewhere a pig dies. <laughs> Most of us are willing to accept that moral responsibility. But, but from that point on, there were a number of decisions to be made. You know, should I, am I willing to take on the responsibility of serving foie gras? In my case, yes. Am I willing to take on the responsibility of bluefin tuna? I'm not sure. Shark, no. Dog, definitely not. Ortolan, maybe if you don't tell anybody. Mm -hmm. But isn't that the whole thing with Ortolan? Don't yeah, tell anybody. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm a hypocrite. I'm a hypocrite. <laughs> would you eat ortolan if I brought some ortolan? Yeah, you totally would. I mean, I would taste it, probably. Taste yeah, you'd it. have one. For research. I would, too. I would need to know what it tastes like. I've never had it. So. 
Right. Yeah, if you don't know, there's a tiny little birds that, that, that you eat whole, like bones, guts. They drown them in Armagnac, and you pick them up by, by their feet, and you, you know, by the head. How many people here would try you put a hood over your head to shield yourself from God. It's like a secret thing. society, and you crunch you through their breast bone. Right. And Actually, we have some right here in this cup. In fact, every look oh, under God. your seats, because everyone's going home with an Ornolog. Your very own. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, so, okay, let's, uh, getting at the, this... <laughs> This is already going south. I said if I started to bomb up here, I was going to ask them people to look at your abs, but hopefully we haven't gotten to that point yet. So. Oh, God, I hope not. No, it's good. Um, so the, the, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation, which helped fund your, their, their, their goal is to um, commit it $130 million, I think, with the idea of reducing yeah. food loss by half, is, which I find a, a difficult goal. By 2000. 30. Yeah. Okay, hold, mark your calendars. But, um, and that's a big, I mean, they're obviously putting this, putting, you know, I don't know what that is for 130 million is a big deal to me. That's a so. fair amount of cash. Yeah, that's yeah. a lot of Ortolan. So what, uh, <laughs> do you think that's gonna happen? Do you think it's realistic? No. You, yeah, okay. I, I think it is, a, a, it is a, a goal worth aspiring to and struggling mightily towards. Let's talk about, the, I think we'll start with America and the American supermarket for a minute because I think that's, you know, in America, food waste looks very different than it does in other countries. So here we're constantly f pushing away calories, right? All of our diets are about calorie restriction. We're all about like, how can I not, oh, I can't have another, like everywhere, food's at the office. So in America, we have a calorie problem, which is that we have way too many and we're constantly trying mm -hmm. to push. And the supermarkets feed that, which you all really illustrate, I think, quite well in the film. So this idea that what, 30% of what a supermarket brings in is so that you can have those big piles of whatever, so it looks abundant, right? And they build that waste into the supermarket system. Right. Which I disgusting. Just, yeah, I, I mean, it's disgusting. You, you know, go to, go to any, any major chain supermarket and think about that tower of perfectly stacked, impeccable oranges or tomatoes and understand that, that supermarket, by design, has already figured and costed out the fact, the immutable fact that they will throw 30% in the garbage just so it will look cool. This is horrifying. And when you travel the world and you see people struggling to live and feed their families and achieve some kind of, you know, some measure of nutrition and dignity in their lives, and these people are heaping, needlessly heaping food designed to be thrown out. Uh, that is truly offensive and, and, and tr but, an obscenity. Well, you talk about in your movie that the, this, you know, we'll get talk a little bit more about the ugly fruit campaign, but that idea that if I want to personally do something about this, I can buy that little bit of a, uh, that pear that's got the little bit of nick in it. or the, Because I'm always like looking for the exact perfect apple. or the, right. Like I pick my thing, you know, I spend a lot of time going through that I, big 30%. I think. I feel guilty now, but I. I don't know that I want to get the bruised pear. I think pear. it's a hard thing but to sell. We've been, we've it doesn't been, taste any different. It doesn't taste different. We, we've been talking about this all day. Yeah, but I know. Day. It's, I don't know. I just want. I'm always been trained to go but for like, the what very about best an looking tomato? thing. It's the ugliest thing in the world, and like all these right. beautiful, like crazy carrots that you get at the right. farmers market, you have to scrub. But when you, sh you guys, chefs are notorious for sending back crates of produce that aren't up to snuff. You know, like I, I don't ever do. Well, because what our customers, rotten. if it's rotten, I'll send it back. But if it's not, like, but I, you know, it's different. I mean, we're always searching for the best. So how do we now change to to I, I think the, the answer bruised. is this, how we value food, what we perceive as beautiful, desirable, and worth paying money for is a completely uh, ephemeral uh, thing that changes from year to year depending That's on true. who yeah. quote unquote thought leaders decide. And the fact is, if enough chefs make ugly tomatoes cool, everybody's going to want cool tomatoes right. and ugly tomatoes. That's going right. to be the big thing. Everyone's going to go to Whole Foods and say, oh, these tomatoes are too, they're not too, bruised too enough. They're, right. they're, all, they're all symmetrical. Yeah. I, I saw Danny on TV and, and, he, and, and he clearly said that ugly tomatoes are where it's at. Now, we'll, this we'll, may not be right. Everyone right. knows that. Though. We'll write a cover <laughs> story about it. It'll be, you know, but, but New York Times. Look, It'll be this is how, this is unf for, rightly or wrongly how we have gotten where we are is that people like Mario Batali decided, I don't care what people think, I know that brains and coxcombs are awesome. And I'm going to put them on my menu. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to convince people due to my bully pulpit on food television and the fact that I'm adorable TV Mario. <laughs> I'm going to convince them, because I've got the juice now, that what I knew all along to be delicious is in fact delicious. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
and they will have the confidence to sell that. And, and that, I think that, it's happening. It, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's happening, and we're, we're seeing that, to I mean, be fair. It happened fair. to skirt steak and hanger steak and all those things that now cost a ton of money. That Pork belly. You know, beef pork cheeks. belly. Look at pork Ox belly. Tails. Pig's feet, bone yeah. marrow, beef yeah. cheeks, bone marrow, like, uh, pig's tail. You know how much you have to pay to get a damn bone <laughs> marrow in yeah. this town? Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable. <laughs> Listen to me, it's unbelievable the cost of bone marrow now. <laughs> but yeah, so. Outrage. But the other thing, though, I think that, that is, um, is interesting, too, is the way that this affects farmers. So, so, you know, the uh, grocery store will say, I want my blue lake green beans to be this long, and maybe I want them tipped or whatever. But I, so the farmer will have to grow a right. field 30% more just to get enough of those beans that are that size, right? By which so, time? Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, it's. it's they're on a, you know, where are the ramps? Right, it's crazy. So, so you all think that this can change, though, right? So we start with America by changing what? Like, what? We start buying the bruised fruit and we start looking, chefs start cooking things that are. Yeah. Um, have the confidence to lead. Um, have the confidence, whether, you're, whether it's your town, your region, your community, to say, I know it's good in my own community. I know. I've lived here all my life. My grandma cooked this. My mom cooked this. Uh, I've learned to cook this over time. I know it's good. And I know, I am reasonably certain you will like it. And if you don't like it yet, you will. And say that long enough and loud enough, and people will come around. We're seeing this with... It, with, with chefs all over. I mean, Sean Brock is probably a, mm -hmm. an obvious example. He's somebody who stood up and said, these simple old things that, that we've forgotten and undervalued are in fact beautiful mm -hmm. and worth celebrating and honoring. And you can track this movement back to, to, to Jeremiah Tower, who are yeah. we talking about or not. It is the self-confidence to say, I don't need imported stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, there's something here that it may not be, you may not have thought it was beautiful last year, but I'm telling you yeah. it's beautiful and it's good. And, and if and enough people say that stridently and, and frequently enough, I believe people will come around. Yeah. I did, um, uh, Stephen Satterfield, who cooks in Atlanta, ha makes this great um, flatbread with this very crispy flatbread with kale stems. Uh, and he rolls them through the pot, and everybody wants the kale stem chips now, like it's kale stems are like the thing, like it's a cool, so you know, it, it happens. How do you feel about kale stems, like, Anthony? Right. How do you feel about kale stems? Look. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to put you on the spot, but. This is the New York Times. We're yeah, going to no. drill down yeah, gotta, on this kale. We're going to blow the lid on this kale stem thing. I'll, I'll tell you this. I, one of my great, the great choices of my life uh, from the very beginning when I first started cooking was uh -huh. Portuguese kale soup. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And the I, potato I know it, it torments me to see Gwyneth Paltrow chugging a kale, <laughs> a kale smoothie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Many and I would really like have. to make a kale joke. Right. The fact is, you kind of like it. Yeah, all right. Hey, you're welcome. Aww. Everyone, I know you all wanted to know what they think. I want to hug him right now. That's awesome. That's how um, you have those abs. Like, yeah. it, it, <laughs> that's so sweet. Hi, who knew he was cuddly like this with the kale? It's so cute. I'm so, uh, I'm so ashamed. <laughs> Um, let's talk about the others, the composting side for one second, uh, mm -hmm. because I know in Seattle, for example, the cost of your little garbage can is very expensive, and it's not so expensive if you, everybody I know in Seattle now has the little composting thing on their counter, if they like it or not, just out of cost. Um, in New York, you, they have street composting that's pretty, how many people here compost in New York? Okay. Whoa. Come to the head of the class, you all. Um, do you live in apartment buildings? All right, look wow. at that, dedicated front row on the wasted thing, though, you know, she's... Um, so I, is, that, is that really going to be effective if more of us start composting? It will be enforced in the future. Yeah, so, so um, and a friend of mine wanted me to ask this, so is this, is this like a, uh, drunk driving or, uh, you know, even getting rid of trans... So if we, <laughs> if we make trans fat, that's what I was going to say, if we make a public health law, we make some sorts of laws and legislation, to enforce waste reduction. Is that the way to go, or is it gonna come up from cooks? It like, would be better. Is this a public and infinitely policy? infinitely preferable, given our libertarian American inclinations. It's very un-American to have the big government step in and say, this is what you should eat, this is how you should handle your waste, you know, maybe you're eating too much, maybe you're eating, you know, that, 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 that is right. fundamentally un-American. 
but it is also inevitable if we don't get our act together. Well, you start taxing cigarettes, the rate of smoking went down. So if we start yeah, how do, making how do they people get away pay with that? for their garbage. Well, that's what they're doing in South Korea. And they're, they're making right, that's money. what they're doing in South Korea. Right, right, and and so. I think that's a model that we're probably right. headed towards if we don't start, uh, if we don't wake up. Meaning, if they weigh your garbage every week, well, yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's like weak. Yeah, they have a great run in your film if you're, about you're, that. You're, you're wasting a lot of stuff. You pay. You yeah. pay more. You're penalized for it. You're, I don't know, taxed right. or... Yeah. Uh, let's let's uh, leave America for a minute. So you went to Japan as part of this, right? Yeah, and I yeah. think we have a really lovely clip oh, of that. Do you, can <laughs> oh, yeah. we... Yeah. Jack? Jack? Are you there, Jack? <laughs> you know this poor guy's name. When he first visited me in San Francisco, I said, Dad, let's go eat tacos. He's like, okay. He's like, just order me what you want, whatever. Just make sure you get me beef. Don't get me anything weird. I was like, okay. So I got him beef, you know, tongue. I got him beef tongue. And he was eating it. I was like, this is amazing. And he's like, yeah, this is like the best thing I've ever had. And I said, oh, it's beef tongue. And he got so angry at me. You know, he's like, why would you do that to me? You know, and I said, well, dad, it's like, is it delicious? And he's like, well, no, it's, it was delicious before I knew what it was. But Kobukuro. Uterus? Uterus. uterus. Yeah, the pork uterus, right? When I ate that, had they not have told me that that's what it was, just like my dad, when I did tell my dad that the beef taco he ate was a beef tongue taco, it was just delicious. <laughs> it's so amazing. And I think that's all it really distills down to is what's delicious. Oppai. Boobs. Oh, it's the, the breast? Breast. The, the tits. Wow. Oh. oh, wow, wow. Japan is a, is a wealth of techniques and knowledge. With the Japanese approach to cooking, it's kind of like this pursuit of perfection. This is like the best thing I've ever had, ever. This is insane. It's it, nice. It was insane, it was really yeah. good. Tell us, about your, tell us about Japan, and particularly we'll start talking about the pigs, but um, yeah. was that your first time there? It wasn't my first time. Um, you know, I went to Japan for the first time when I was like, I think like 28 or something like that, um, with my wife. and. We were going to Korea, and um, and but that was not that was my first time like being hosted by like a chef, you know, a Japanese chef, and him showing me around. So like, um, it was really eye opening. Like I got to I got to visit this um, farm where they fed pigs this basically like probiotic like. Um, they call it echo feed yeah, or echo. Eco feed. Yeah, yeah eco it's like feed. they take like bluefin tuna scraps or like green tea, like. Um, and, and because they, there's a law in. To, is it Tokyo or is it state, uh, countrywide, where you have to actually re recycle food, right? Right, right. I mean, because they also, I think they identify the problems. And I think it was with the grocery stores and mm -hmm. the amount of food they're wasting. Um, and so they take all that food and mush it all up. Yeah, they make it like into like a kind of like a kombucha kind of situation. Kind of a one of Paltrow sort of stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Drink. Like you yeah. can chug it by the gallon. Yeah, and, and then they and, put the probiotics in it. Yeah. And then no, they they just it kind of ferments and it's ah. like naturally like they don't aren't putting any sort of antibiotics in this food at all. And um, I got to taste a lot of different, I mean, aside from that, I got to taste some really delicious pork too. And it was, it was amazing. Like the one that was fed tuna scraps was like insanely rich and delicious. Really? Um, and there's somebody who's like just feeds melon, only melon to the pigs or melon scraps. Uh, that was I think, I'm sure. I think there's a great yeah. um, scene in the movie, which I like recommend you all go see of Danny feeding the pigs with this echo stuff. Yeah, this I got eco to hold stuff. the big trough so, thing and yeah. they were so happy. Farm boy, like, you ain't. Yeah, they I were know. like, no, I mean, <laughs> I did it. And this I is like Japanese there. farmer <laughs> woman and she's standing next to him and he's like, oh, so they're liking this, they're, they're eating, right? And she's like, yeah, they're yeah. pigs, they eat. Yeah, pigs. <laughs> she's like, she was like 80 or something. She, she was, was great. Like, every she's morning just like, she just goes out and feeds yeah. them. It was, it was amazing. Yeah, that's a great piece of the... It was really amazing. Yeah, so the pork actually tastes different yeah, it was incredible. I mean, it was like, you know, you think of like how you, like a mangalitsa pig or like acorn fed pigs have this like nutty kind of undertone and richness. Um, it was a lot, I thought it would be like, it was leaner than I thought it would be. I thought it would be like really rich and fatty. Um, but the flavor was just so pronounced. And, it, and, it, and honestly, I think I say it in the movie, but it's like, I feel like it was the first time I ever tasted pork, like in my entire life mm -hmm. for real. It's like, it was so insane. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't aged or anything, it was just, they're like, here you go. They just fried it in some panko. It was right. amazing. People need to understand this, uh, that, that, that you could taste terroir, you can taste what a pig ate, you can taste whether it died happy, you can taste if it, if, you know, if it, if it died frightened and stressed. Uh, you know, there's a lot of overlap, actually, between what chefs want uh, and animal activists, and I think this is a, 
there's an area of mutual agreement and uh, common interest that has been overlooked. Uh, so just understand welfare. better than anybody that that you know a happy animal is what you want. An animal who who dies afraid and stressed or eating bad things uh, is bad. Uh, that an animal who eats a specific food, like uh, in, a, in the case of a pig, I mean, I guess the acorn-fed uh, Iberical hams are probably the most prized in the world, but now we're really breaking new ground with the pig. Yeah, that's insane. About. Yeah. That oh, that's insane. Tuna pig. Um, the other piece of this, too, is um, food waste, not from our plates, but also getting technology to farmers. And a little bit goes a long way. I, I was talking to a, a fellow from University of Illinois who's got a program in which they've helped just change uh, the drying techniques for grain farmers in India. So instead of these old coal dryers, they just improved the drying techniques and they, the, the loss that they had from their grain rotting just went way down. So there's wow. little pieces like that about waste that I think you know, farmers who are um, harvesting and are better plugged into weather patterns so they're not losing so much in the field. I think there's a real um, loss of in the field kind of piece to this too that is, yeah. I think, pushing against it um, as much as your eating uterus does. But um, I, I think they're both coming together. Um, earlier you mentioned that there's a moral imperative to this too. Um, I know you're a, a, a meditator and a spiritual guy, but not a very religious guy. But um, yeah. You know, and in the film, and I hear, I heard Mario like it's sinful to waste food. And I remember my mother, she had Italian immigrant parents, and she'd say, "There are people starving in Europe. You've got to eat." Um, China, pick whatever country. So, what is where does that come from in us? That that piece where wasting food feels, I guess, well, sinful, for lack of a better word. Look, this is an immigrant country. You know, most of our grandparents, our parents, came from somewhere else. They have, you know, powerful memories of you know, every scrap being important. You know, all you need to look at is Italian-American food, traditional uh, 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 Italian-American food, the giant meatball, the over-sauced pasta, this reaction to, oh my God, we're in America, a land of abundance. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you look at the traditional dishes of, of uh, you know, Sicily and, and, and uh, southern Italy, and you see where cucina povera, where, where these, the real engine of gastronomy comes from, you know, I think most of us, I know I did grew up with where, yes, wasting food was a sin. Somebody's going hungry, like your grandparents or someone your grandparents knew, or your parents. Food is, you know, people kill for food. They invade other countries. They do terrible, terrible, terrible things. We're all four days away from slaughtering our neighbors. If your children are hungry, by day four, you're perfectly, you know, the idea that you're gonna go next door and kill your neighbors and take their food seems entirely reasonable. It may not seem reasonable in New York City, but I assure you it is reasonable in a lot of the places that I've been. Um, so yeah, it's a joke to say, you know, somebody, you know, eat, your, eat all your food uh, because somebody's starving in India Okay, that may be a, a joke, but at some point in your family's history, whoever said that, whoever's, whoever started that echo, they meant it. All right. Did you grow up with that same thing? or is, does, does not wasting food feel like a spiritual imperative to you, Danny? Um, you know, I grew up with, my, my upbringing was interesting. I was adopted, I grew up I'm Korean, but I was adopted, I grew up in Oklahoma um, with American parents, so for me, um, my dad was, worked at General Motors, and my mom uh, had a newspaper route. And so like every night we ate like, uh, that like ground beef, like ground beef was like in every, every meal we had, <laughs> like hamburger helper every night, you know? So like um, going out to like a fancy restaurant for me was like if we went to Olive Garden, you know what I mean? So like food was very excitable for me, um, but yeah, I mean, there was, we definitely were on a budget, you know, like every night, my mom would, we would go to like, I think like the equivalent of like a Costco or something and buy like a bunch of ground beef. I remember we just buy a bunch of ground beef and she would come home and she would wrap it in like one pound increments and freeze it and every night. I, when I got home from school, I would take it out and thaw it and then she would make, you know, hamburger helper. So um, I feel like food in the beginning, it wasn't like this thing that was excitable for me. Like I think going out to eat at restaurants was exciting, but when it was because we couldn't afford to eat out every night, 
we had to take our leftovers home and I had to eat them. So yeah, I mean, I think that was the closest. I mean, I didn't grow up like eating. There was a big disconnect for me. And it was interesting because I, I always wanted to have Korean food, but there was no Korean food in, in Oklahoma growing up. So that's had nothing to do with your question. But I, yeah, no, no, that's this interesting. Is another, I'm like, wow, we're going to need another hour. This is, so. the, this is the, the, the story of so many chefs I know. You know the, the, it's a rejection or a reaction to these you know, childhood. these child, these food-free yeah. childhoods, you know, where food was like this wonderful right. escape. Right, right. I love that one of your first jobs as a, as a young, you know, sous chef was to take the hamburger out of the freezer. Oh, uh, yeah, you yeah. You know, like your first Well, because my mom was so deathly afraid. I was a very small kid. I weighed like 75 pounds in the ninth grade. So, like, my mom was, like, afraid I would get hurt um, in playing sports. So I just had to go to church all the time, and then I would come home and cook di lunch, like dinner with her after school. So um, I would, we would watch, she would turn on the TV and we'd watch like Emerald and we would like make Hamburger Helper. That was kind of my, <laughs> my thing. It's a big piece of the puzzle, isn't yeah. it? I just, I don't know. We're gonna start to take questions. There's two microphones. Um, don't be shy, I don't know if nobody wants to be the first one, but um, hopefully we'll have a good discussion um, going. You have to go to the microphone, ma'am, I'm sorry. That's how it is. Let me, while she's getting up there, what are we going to do, speaking of Olive Garden, about the endless salad bowl and the cheesecake factory portions? And the, you know, we're in America, we can eat, in, in, we're in Trump's America especially. Yeah. Oh, just a minute, this just in. Oh, no, these are, other, these are oh, Facebook look, questions. I had, this, I had this discussion with, of all people, Ted Nugent, <laughs> who holds Michelle Obama in, you know, existential contempt. He target practices with her picture. Yeah, yeah. Um, for whatever reason, I have a collegial relationship with Ted Nugent. I don't really understand this. I am opposed to just about everything he believes in, as he is opposed to mine. But you uh, get a bromance. But I found, I wouldn't go that far okay. uh, at all. No, I reject that very notion. Okay. But I said to him, look. Fake news. I, 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 I positioned Michelle Obama's lunch program as not as a moral obligation, which would be threatening to his libertarian values, but as a national security problem. I said, look, Ted, you know, we're surrounded by hostile enemies. Uh, you know, it's a military readiness issue. You know, we gotta think about the health of our children, how much we eat, you know, these double portions, you know, cheesecake factory, this is anti-American. It, it's eroding our ability to smoke, you know, uh, Al-Qaeda out of the right, hole. Right, right. And Not he actually agreed with me. He them. did. So you talked Ted Nugent into supporting Michelle Obama's Better Nutrition for Children yes, program. Yes, I did. Let's give that up. <laughs> Very impressive. Um, let's start. We'll start here, and then we'll go to you. Do you. And again, just want to remind you guys, we prefer questions as opposed to speeches. Just throwing that out there. Okay. Um, I'm asking a question. As a child and into my teenage years, I would go out and I would see how much food is wasted in restaurants. At school, how they served us food, and you'd see all the food being thrown away. You talked about how everything in the kitchen is organized and nothing is wasted, but then what happens to the food when it goes out to the people mm -hmm. who's not cooking it? Right. And, and how do we teach okay. our, our children about not wasting when everywhere they look, they see it. That's look, good question. What, Thank what, you. Once food goes out to the dining room, the restaurant loses control of it. You, 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 you know, Eric Repair at La Bernada wastes a lot of food in the sense that his customers expect perfect little squares of evenly portioned fish, but he makes sure that whatever he loses or wastes in the process of getting to those portions is given to City Harvest or other, uh, other uh, services that, 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 that serve people in need. But once it goes out on the dining room, if the customer leaves something on their plate, that's dead to the world. So how do you educate, how do you, how do you make, how do you shame people? Well, don't, you don't have to into, shame because really, them. No, no, I, I, look, Maybe not. do not underestimate the value of shame. <laughs> <laughs> I've never under, uh, underestimated. You know, mom did it. We were talking about, you yeah. know, eat your food. Yeah. People are starving in India. How can you waste that when there's somebody going hungry somewhere else? 
So um, start when they're little and shame the hell out of them. Right, right. Look, I, 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 you know, I think it's something we, it's, in, it, it's inappropriate now to shame someone. Right. But there's um, certainly values you can teach a kid, like we don't waste. I mean, just sort of right. in the day to day. No, I, I believe in shaming people in. for a number of reasons. How's if, your ten-year-old around if, that? Good. Uh, I think she's cool with it. Look, if if if, if you're blocking my fire exit, shame I, on I, you. I think it's worth commenting on. Yeah. Um, I think um, if you cannot cook for yourself and a few friends I, in a perfect world. If you were not able to prepare a few basic dishes for the people in your dorm, your lover, your partner, your friends, if called upon to do so, if you can't make an omelet in the morning or at least scrambled eggs, if you're that hopeless, yeah, you should feel ashamed of that. <laughs> okay. Let's go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm on the board of a food pantry in Mount Kiska, New York, in Westchester County, which is a very rich county. And we fed last year over 39,000 people. Wow. So <clears throat> what I'm asking you is, as a pantry, we, we screened your film during Hunger Awareness Month in September. And we had a lot of our board members, a lot of our supporters there. Um, and we came away extremely moved, all of us. And so what I'm asking you, as a pantry that provides food for families, how can we work with our clients and maybe work with our donors, work with our community to, to develop some kind of program where we address food waste? You know, Look, comp I, I, we're I, thinking I, of starting a composting uh, but, you know, what could we do as a pantry because our focus is feeding? Well, look, I think that's, <clears throat> that's a lot. You're doing a lot. Um, I think reaching out to chefs have been leading in the areas of, uh, of uh, hunger, addressing hunger issues and, and in waste as well. Chefs have been leading in this issue from very early on. Right. So I would expect that people in your area, chefs, are waiting to be told how can we effectively use all of the food that you would otherwise be wasting to actually doing some good. And uh, that would be a big, you know, that would be a big step. A lot of us are, are I mean, look, I, I haven't cooked in 17 years. It's difficult for, for a lot of restaurants who would like, who are aware, painfully aware of how much food, extra food they're generating. They would really like that food to quickly and efficiently be delivered to somebody who needs it. That's a disconnect that really needs working on. There are a lot of regulations, liabilities, difficulties right. yeah. in that area. Who will take, who will process that food? Who will take that scraggly looking whole fish with a whole bunch of meat on it and bother to make it into something good that could actually, you know, uh, uh, you know feed people and give them pleasure and make them feel happy? Um, there are great possibilities there that, that have yet to be addressed, and I think that's an area that could well, be In the film, you, uh, you're in Italy where... Oh, uh, Massimo uh, Bottura, yeah. Right, yeah, where he the, turns, yeah. he actually takes food scraps and turns them into this like lovely, simple meal um, for people in need, and it, it looked like a beautiful dining room, and he, he turns bread and waiters, into... waiters yeah. serve them with dignity, and they right. treat them, you know, they're not slopping it out of a bucket. So why don't chefs... Maybe this could be your next thing. Yeah, I mean, Maybe. again, it's like. It, Did that it, inspire you when you saw his? To think yeah, about I mean, I was bummed I couldn't go. I wanted to go because yeah. I know it's during the Milan Expo, and he told me about it. He was like really excited about this years ago. He's like, dude, I'm gonna do this thing. For you, if you don't know, like Massimo Batura opened up like a soup kitchen. Like it's a soup kitchen. He's like in front of like one of the best chefs in right. the yeah. world. Yeah, yeah, in front of like like the Milan Expo. In Milan, so it yeah. was like all of, you know, it was feeding tons of homeless people who were coming and eating and they were being served by servers from his restaurant. They'd train everyone classical, He's you know, taking like them three like customers yeah. with dignity. And, 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 and really taking nice. like three and four day old bread and, and grating it and making it into um, a kind of a pasta right, right, and serving right. it in a broth that was made with sort of scraps and it was the most beautiful dish and, right. and served but, by But waiters. which is also about as old school Italian as old school right. Italian right. gets. Right. These right. Were may, um, stuff. may I be bold? Um, we're having a, a fundraiser to raise money because we're all volunteers. Um, and God, we're doing York. this thing Check called this Empty Bowls. 
And if I could have your autograph, I could put it on a bowl and auction it off that and raise for money you, for yeah. our kids. Right. <coughs> I have the, uh, the pen. For I, I have a pen. She's ready to I go. I love this. Nobody else, you don't get him to sign your shirt or your shoulder or your dress or anything. Um, Danny, while he's, while he's signing, let me ask you, yeah. we have uh, Elizabeth, we have some Facebook questions that um, uh, people have on Facebook, thank you, people on Facebook, have sent some questions in. So Elizabeth from Facebook asks, one in four households is single person, how can they prevent food waste? So there, I think there's this feeling, obviously Elizabeth lives alone. Hi, yeah. Elizabeth. You're not alone. We're all with you on Facebook. We're here. But um, here. we're here for you, Elizabeth. Here. But it, it is true, I think one person feels a little overwhelmed by all this. Um, right, and if right. you're just making your little, you know, you're getting, eating your little noodles, your sesame noodles at home. But Elizabeth, it's okay. You're not going to be alone forever. Um, but I, what, what, is, what does one individual person do if they're not cooking for a family, they don't have a real active kitchen? Is there... Is there something they can do about food waste or about, about this issue? It's a lot about planning, and I know it's difficult because as a chef, it's like, oh, it's easy, just make a list and work a list, and like, but no, it's like people, it's, it is challenging. It's like, it's, I think it's a lot of thinking ahead and also slowing down, and, and like if you're gonna get a rotisserie chicken, which I do all the time because I don't like mm -hmm. cooking at home when I'm not working. Where's your um, favorite rotisserie chicken? Oh, uh, where is it? Costco? I, no, no. No, right. no. See, there's some people love the Costco um, chicken. I, yeah, I don't know. Where, they have really good ones at this place, but my house. Like, okay. I don't want to tell everybody. That's where the best rotisserie chicken oh, is. I don't, I don't it's wanna, it's wanna, like this place by my house. It's, 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 always... it's, it's a Dominican place. I'll leave it at that. Okay. It's bomb. It's so good. But we'll get it, and I'll take it home, and then I'll just like literally just put it in a pot when we're done eating it and put water on it and bring it to a summer, season it. And then I'll just like turn it off like, and, like, and like, let it sit there for, until I go to bed, just mm -hmm. like not even cooking. Like that's not difficult, and then you pour it off, you have broth for the next morning. Yeah, but it is, for me that's easy, because I mean, I'm, it's not that easy, but I'm, it's, it, it's, it's, it's easy to say, oh, think ahead and make a list and prep, and, but it's not that easy. So yeah. I think um, outside of just cooking at home by yourself, I think you know, buying the ugly fruit in the supermarket. Talking like, to your friends about it too. Yeah, I mean, just organizing you know, a waste dinner party, doing or just, whatever it yeah, takes to having change culture. Having potlucks, I don't know. Yeah, yeah but. waste potlucks. Okay, great. Yes, you're up, and then you're up, sir. So companies like Blue Apron, is this a step forward Good or question. is it a step backwards mm. because of the Meal waste kit. they use to package like one teaspoon of cumin? Right, but then you're not throwing yeah. away all the radicchio. So it's interesting, meal kits. What's your take on meal kits? Uh, and meal, meal kits, kits in general? I'm, I'm right. existentially opposed to. Okay. Yeah. Look, I, I like delivery food, okay? When I come back, I'm in a way for two, three weeks. I'm like, you know, you know in, in Borneo, and, and you know, I haven't seen anything like a high pressure shower in a long time, and I'm starting to crave a pastrami sandwich. And, you know, I, I take like a 16 hour flight, I arrive in New York. You know, I'm calling Pastrami Queen or, uh, or you know, one of the services that will get me Pastrami Queen. Is there a Pastrami Queen? Uh, Goddamn right. Um, but the meal kit where everything's done for you, no. Well, no. it's just, it's pre measured, but you do all the cooking. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know. But I think it's also, people are cooking who maybe were a little intimidated by the whole process, and I think it is bringing people back to the kitchen. I don't think they're going to last forever, but I think it's kind of a transitional moment in the way Rachel Ray teaching people to cook in 30 minutes was a transitional right. moment. It brought people into the yeah. kitchen in a way. I so. suspect I'm, I'm guilty of fogeyism on this. Have we lost his audio? Here comes the audio guy. This isn't Hello. Jack. This is the audio guy. Um, <laughs> Uh, yes, why don't you go ahead and ask your question. Oh, wait, although, Danny, I have a question. Did you have a, a meal kit? You want to weigh in on the meal kit issue? I've never, like, actually... Even meal kits, pro or con? Um, I mean, you're right. It's like, on one hand, you have people getting in the kitchen and cooking that would be intimidated by that. And I think that there's nothing better than, like you said, I mean, to answer, like, what you were saying, is if you can't cook three to four things, you know, like, th that's just a basic thing. Learn to cut shit. Learn to cut shit. Learn basic knife work. Anything okay. that prevents you from doing that, I'm opposed to. I don't okay. care. You know what I mean? This is always, I, get a, I actually, you know, dirty little secret, I actually get along very well with Rachel Ray. Yeah, I she like actually, Rachel Ray. She has a sense of I'm humor. and we, She's amazing. But, but, I love you know, Rachel Ray. You know, don't, don't you know, she how hard shit. is it to cut a head of lettuce? She cuts shit. Yes, competently. Okay. All right. Yeah. Yes, so. but, 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 you know, but I'm, I'm saying 
anyone who tells you, you know, buy the pre-cut onion, I'm against. Right. Yeah. That's evil. But the meal kits do send you like the whole sweet potato. You actually do have never to seen, cut it. I've actually so. never seen one. So a I meal kit, yeah. Whole. I've seen yeah, them in they my will apartment. send you a whole meal. They'll send you the it's sweet like potato, yeah. and then they might have a little dab of the sauce, and then they have a little, and they say go. You know, I mean, the chicken breast might already be kind of skinned and bone for you, or whatever it is. But they actually have to chop things right. These people have no. So food. maybe this is good. Yeah, I think it's transitional. I don't think it's bad, necessarily. That's a packaging Kim, what, issue. What do you think I about milk? Did you have? Do you utilize milk kits? Ever, I did. Or? I did because I was writing about them, um, and I, so I had ordered three different kinds. And so for a month or so, I had this like a month and a half. And and I, I actually kind of at first liked them, and a minute I was like, God, this is Tuesday night. And I'm actually cooking something decent. I found a place in California. I, I mean, I, it was kind of nice. But then it builds up, right? And so then I got to dinner with my friends or my kids sick or, you know, and so then I've got two meals in that fridge and I'm like, oh shit, I gotta cook these. Yeah, and, gotta, then, and pretty soon, you know. But you don't then, have to cut shit. I yeah, know. I know, I did, I cut shit, I cook shit. It was good shit. It was all <laughs> the shits. But, uh, but it kind of built up on me. It doesn't, it didn't adapt to life, you know, and plus I like to go to the grocery store a lot. I just yeah. love that. So I don't, I didn't, at some point I wanted to be picking out my own, although now bruised zucchinis yeah. I will pick out. But, you know, so for me it kind of took some of the joy out of the whole process. And I didn't, man I like to manage my kitchen, you know, and that yeah. takes, it takes away that, you know, kind of the thrill of when right. you don't think there's anything for dinner and you're like, oh, you know what I can do? Right. Like, so it took the joy out of that. But this isn't about me. Let's go to your question, <laughs> sir. I'd like to thank the panel for this uh, very nice discussion on uh, food and uh, nutrition. And um, I'm here, uh, Mr. Borden Anthony, that I've been watching your shows on TV with a passion for so many years. And uh, it was my dream to see you in person and to uh, reach out to you and see, I've seen the real, the real starvation as a medical student in India. I've seen kids dying, coming into the emergency wards, and now as a grown-up physician, almost retired, I've gone out to Zimbabwe and other countries to do volunteer work, and so has my son, who's also an emergency medicine doctor. And I'm trying to go to Puerto Rico soon to help out over there, even though I don't speak the language that well. But putting that aside, I've traveled far and wide, not as much as you and Mrs. Clinton, but about 80 countries worldwide for personal tourism and volunteer work and medical conferences and other things. I want to reach out to you and ask you, is it ever possible or conceivable that I could time my trips when you are out there? Ah. <laughs> so your question is, can he have a date with you? Huh, and this is an I'm not, I'm, I'm not looking for money. I'm not looking for... Yeah. For, for, All right. I, He's I, not going to ask you to sign anything. He just wants to travel where you're traveling. Actually... Anything is possible, my friend. It is? And, I, and, I, and I, I, I have a lot of respect for you and... and, and, and I'm grateful for, I know what, I know the places that you've been working and I know what that involves and uh, I'm grateful for what you've, you've been doing. Thank you. Hard, it's really hard. Yeah, top that friend, go ahead. <laughs> that dick joke is not gonna go down well now. So, um, I don't mean to be offensive, but right now you're preaching to the choir. Okay. Most Sorry. of us here are food people, and we want to do food waste in a better way. I work at Princeton University, I'm a chef there, and we have two opposing problems. We have the freshman 15, and we have a huge uh, waste problem. Not the kitchen, front of the house. Mm -hmm. We do have uh, what we call pig buckets, because we used to sell it to a pig farmer, but now we, we compost it. But we are doing tons of food waste a year. I was wondering, is there a way to bring your documentary and yourselves to a place where we might do a little bit more good, such as Princeton University, where you could have be in front of people that are the next generation who haven't thought about food waste for ever or ever have thought about it, and possibly can have a little more contribution to it than we do? They should just run your documentary in a loop in all, every college cafeteria. I mean, you are invited yeah. to Princeton whenever you think. All right, so Finally. can he bring the guy from India? To Princeton? That would be good. Then y'all could just do all that. Bro date. All right. I'd love to come to Princeton. Thank you. Do you want to? Go I ahead, I would go Danny. to Princeton. That'd be amazing. What do you think? I mean, I, this is, and it gets to another, we had another Facebook question. Somebody wanted to know, Greg, like, how do we influence and educate people who grow up far removed from their food? I mean, it is preaching to the choir a little here, but what's the next steps? 
Can you guys just solve everything? No, everything is just so instantly, it's not, it's not difficult. I mean, chefs just have to stand up and people have to like start talking about this because, I mean, like I said, I was, I'm a chef, I'm supposed to know about this. I didn't really know a lot about it. And, and I think that everything's so accessible. I mean, like we find out all of our news on like our phones. It's like everything is just so instantaneous now. Accessibility is there. So I think it's just people standing up and like saying something, talking and about it. And I think it. if hotel chains can get us to all like not let them change our sheets because we think it's somehow right. well, that's, better that's, for the environment. Right. Well, they have that never, option at some hotel. Right. So, but like we've all kind of been trained in that. Like, oh, I don't oh. need my sheets washed a second night. And why can't we do that with food waste? I mean, I think it seems to be big corporate efforts need to happen here too. I don't know. I'm just sort of kind of still dazzled that, 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 that chefs now actually have to contemplate they might have some responsibility, some social responsibility. This is the last thing in the world the chefs ever expected. Uh, most chefs of my generation got into the business because they had poor communication skills. Uh, no, no, I mean, they, they sensed in themselves poor reading skills, frequently dyslexic, uh, not the smartest kid in the family, particularly for in the French system, you know, it was the, the smarter older brother or sister who got sent off to, to university. The second kid was packed off to be an apprentice at a, you know, a, a, a local butcher. You entered the food business because you were a loser, because you were a bad communicator, because you were inadequate to do an office job. And yet here we are discussing. I was thinking, I was, I was actually going to ask Danny, do, do, do chefs have an innate responsibility as they deal with food to, to deal with that food responsibility, responsibly, uh, to communicate that relationship with food in a articulate way. And as horrifying as that concept might be to me, or at least the old me, I guess the answer has become yes. And, well, and, and I think yeah. many chefs have learned to do that very, very, very well, to be fair. No, yeah. like you said, food touches a lot of social issues, and you guys are the direct line with the food. So as you said earlier in the show, I think you do. Well, you made a movie about it, so yeah. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Hi. Talking about parts unknown. I could you could you speak a little closer to the mic? I want every yes? single word. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. I would say talking about parts unknown. I grew up in Suriname, which is in South America, a not well known country. And actually, growing up, um, protein was very expensive, um, which is common in a lot of third world countries. Um, so. Sunday was a special day, not because of the church, but because my mom would make meat, which um, was only on Sunday, not during the rest of the week. So um, growing up, you basically get respect for food because it's expensive. My question is, is the f price of food fair given the resources needed, also from nature, to actually um, produce food? Best question ever. Cheap food. Short answer. No, the price of food is not fair. We should be charging much more for protein. We will, eventually and inevitably. And your experience uh, growing up in Suriname, is, it, it's the story of Italy. Yes. <laughs> of, of the Sunday gravy, of, of, of the you know, meat, finally, of a largely, of, of Provence, of all these places, these food cultures that we tend to over-romanticize, were in fact hungry, largely poor. Meat was a big deal, and most of the places I go on my show, meat is still a big deal. Um, you know, it, it, it's something that, that yeah. we, we have come to forget to a great extent, and I hope we, we, we get in touch with again. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, Mission Chinese, you guys are slyly moving away from meat overkill, yes? Yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, it's, you want people to, I mean, I like eating lots of different things, you know, and I don't like getting, like, blown out anymore as much as I used to. Like, because chefs, it, it was like, for a long time, it was all about, like, opulence and indulgence and how much, you know, like, we could feed you or how fat we can get eating food ourselves, you know. But it's changed a lot. You know, I think it's, everyone's getting a lot more mature about about yeah, I think one of the most exciting tradition. restaurants in America is uh, Ludo Lefebvre's uh, Trois Mecs in San Francisco. I mean, in Los Angeles. It's, it, it, it's in a little strip mall. It looks like a pizzeria, but it's a, you know, it's a restaurant with a prefix menu. Uh, how many courses? Six, seven, eight, eight yeah. courses. You, you book in advance, like buying a theater ticket. 
If you don't show up, you still paid for the ticket. So they know exactly how many dinners they're going to serve that night. So at the end of the night, there's zero waste because they've figured it out. I've got 30 reservations coming tonight. I have enough food for 30 people. And what's really amazing about it is you eat all of these courses of delicious, savory, incredibly flavorful food, and I'm a very meat-centric guy. <laughs> and I walked out of there, and about 30 minutes later, I realized, wow, I just ate about maybe four ounces of meat. I had no, I didn't notice. And you were incredibly satisfied. And I was incredibly right. satisfied. Right. Right. Um, do you want to share your news for a sec? Can I share no, your news? Not. What, what? Oh, well, he's There's opening a new do. Mission That's Chinese. It's, it's like, news in Bushwick. Yeah, yeah. So. Mm -hmm. You found out today, right? Yeah, yeah, we found out today. All right, mazel tov. All right, I just wanted to share Thanks. that because I'm so excited for you. Yes, your Surprise. question. Hello. It's actually kind of a follow-up to that question, um, which is given the kind of the impact and knowledge, the, impact, the knowledge of the impact that our protein has on both the environment and on waste, what is the correct protein? To be like, what is the best, most sustainable protein that we should be eating? That's not made in Silicon you might not Valley. That. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, you're right. Look, I don't know. Look, uh, green stuff ain't so great on the environment either. We're dumping I don't know what percentage of our water into these. You know, any any rom over romantic notions that we're going to return to some agrarian vegetarian wonderland. Who's going to work on those farms? Are you gonna? <laughs> no, you're not. You know, people from Mexico are, are, and other countries are going to be are going to be picking those vegetables. Is that a good? Is that a world you want to live in, or would you like to force people from cities out onto the farms to work these wonderlands? People um, have tried that, didn't work so well. Yeah, it didn't work out so good. Right. Um, so I'm not going to over romanticize green stuff, but what 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 what's the best protein? Probably pigs. pigs. What? Yeah, pigs. pigs. Pork. They wander freely, they're low maintenance. Uh, they're delicious. They're incredibly, like Homer Simpson, noted gastronome said, they're a magical animal. <laughs> you know, what's the line? It's like bacon, pork, I can't have pork chops, Lisa? How about bacon? Dad, it's the same animal. <laughs> yeah, sure, Lisa. <laughs> yeah. Magical animal. animal. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. yeah, pound for pound, you're pig. How about you? Uh, what's the best protein to eat? Best protein to eat. Or Sustainably sustainable deliciousness, eat. cooking, all of it? All of it. Okay. And I've heard oysters, oysters are very sustainable, but I, that's oysters? obviously a price point. Yeah, I mean, the no Gowanus problem. Canal oysters. Right. I mean, <laughs> actually, if we raise kui, uh, you know, little guinea pigs like mm -hmm. they do in Peru, that would probably be the most sustainable protein. They're like little pigs, and you're going to raise them everywhere. They, they, they reproduce like crazy. That but would the, go really the bacon well. strips are that big on those little pigs. They're not very, it's, yeah. Portion control. Right, there you go. Uh, we have just about five minutes, so let's, kind of, let's try to get everybody in here. I was wondering if you, either of you could speak to the relationship between climate change and food, and I guess it's been touched on, you know, talking about the beef industry and sustainability, but if you have any other thoughts I, about climate the, change. The um, amount of methane produced yeah. by food in the landfills. I thought, oh, if you threw away food, it was fun. It helped it compost the landfill. No. Wrong, right? Okay. Tell me about that. Well, the, the offset of methane gas from all this food we're throwing away is like, it has a direct impact on the environment. And it's just, that's, the thing about this whole documentary, and that, that's actually touched on in depth in the film, is that like, it's all something we can change. It's all something we can tangibly all, it's not a hopeless situation. The statistics are extremely staggering, but it's something that we can fix, you know, and that's, aside from that, I really don't, I mean, the climate change issue, it's like, it makes sense to just stop throwing this food into a landfill because it's not, it isn't, the, that, you're right, that's, it's not, it doesn't end there. It's not like, oh, everything's cool now. Yeah. It's not. I, yeah, that was, that was interesting to yeah. me. Yes, go ahead. Hello, uh, I'm the co-founder of an app that is called Food for All. We're a group of uh, grad students, and something that you said that we, we understood that was, we're passionate about food waste, about solving the problem of food waste. Something that you mentioned that was very challenging is the produced food, and that's something that we're tackling. Uh, what, we, uh, what we're doing is we allow people to buy the surplus food from restaurants one hour before they close at a deep discount. Now we have a little bit over 60 restaurants in Boston and New York, and one of the big challenges that we have is convincing corporations. Believe it or not, one of the main things that they say is that they don't have any food waste. How do you start speaking with corporations and bringing them on board in, into something like this? You want to take that? Wow. Good question. Shame, again. <laughs> 
Don't ever underestimate it. Yeah. Shame and mockery. Right. I mean, and public I, I'm, humiliation is that also public humiliation, shame, and mockery are effective tools uh, of agitprop and social activism that should never be underestimated. I mean, Donald Trump is extremely uncomfortable. Nothing torments him more than Saturday Night Live. Is it going to change the world? No, but it's going to make him have a bad night. Right. So we've all done something. Please, go ahead. I wrote my question down so I wouldn't ramble. Um, as a student who's been working on farms, I work in Red Hook right now on a community farm, um, I've had exposure and access, free access to great produce. Um, how can other students like myself and other people my age have access to like organic good food without being priced out because, you know, Whole Foods, Whole whole paycheck, essentially. Yeah, that's a really good and, and extremely difficult, and the answer is really unpopular. Organic, responsibly raised food will only become more and more expensive and will be available only to wealthy people. You're kind of bringing us down now. So you could, work at, you could work at a restaurant. Like, you yeah. could work at a restaurant. Yeah, you pay for that. Yeah. All right. uh, that is a luxury that most of the world can't afford, but, uh, and we need to appreciate that yeah. and understand yeah. it and not be judgmental about it. But I, I just... Another point of view. I mean, think about how much we pay for our phones or our shoes or right. our, you know, I mean, we'll pay an incredible amount for tennis shoes, but we get upset if a, a, an organic tomato costs a lot. You're, really, you're either wealthy or not wealthy at all. But you, you know, there are a lot of people eating organic food in this world, um, but it is because that is, they're, they're living very close to the land. Um, Cuba, for example. Well, no, we, West Virginia, yeah. uh, where I just spent a, a considerable amount of time. And in a perfect world, we would all eat healthier, and ideally it would, you know, organic. Right. Arguably, it's good. But, but it is, uh, unfortunately, to become a boutique item. The same people who are selling organic food at Whole Foods also own the inorganic, I mean, it's the same company. <laughs> they get you coming and going. You know, eat the Cheetos, but if you want to eat the organic version, we own that company too. We may call it Earthbound or, you know, right. you know, Grandma Somebody's, but basically it's the same company. Right. Um, we're almost out of time. I had one last question. Laura from Facebook, this is a good one to end on. Of all the places you've traveled, which location has influenced you the most? Well, both of you. Um. And where do you think people should go travel next? Uh, you should, you should. Uh, Vietnam. Vietnam is See a how, to... get in touch with an important part of American history. Visit a country that's diverse and, and intensely regional and, and, and proudly regional, like very much like Italy in many ways. Topographically interesting. Lovely, kind, welcoming, generous, proud, fierce people. Incredible food. Um, in a place that's very different than, than and where I grew up, anyway. This was a life-changing experience for me in a place I keep going back to. All right, Vietnam, Danny. Um, I mean, South Korea's gotta be it for me because that's where I'm from. Go for the home team. I didn't grow yeah. up there, yeah. And I was like, I didn't even go there until I met Young Me, and we, I was like 26 or something. Like, how old was I? Like 26, 24? Uh, it was like, you know, I know there's, it's interesting because it didn't feel foreign to me at all. I mean, but I don't speak Korean. People will come up and be like, hey, speaking to Korean to me, and I just have to be like, I'm sorry, I don't speak Korean, and it's just really confusing. But, um, but uh, I, yeah, Korea, South Korea. All right. So. Listen, thank you all for coming, and thank, thank you. you.